So without any further ado, let me ask him to come to the stage and please welcome uh, Samad Masood Vasencha. Thanks. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks. So <clears throat> I'm going to be talking really about uh, how large corporates and small nimble startups work together or, uh, or don't uh, and why they should. And I've coined this term collaborative disruption which I think is sort of crucial to the future uh, growth of the UK uh, and future entrepreneurial growth of the UK um, because of the, the, the sort of certain dynamics of our, of our uh, uh, economy versus Silicon Valley. So, just to set the scene, because everyone talks about digital, particularly in, in a consulting firm like Accenture, where you know, we're actually rated every month on how many buzzwords we can come up with, um, I'm, I'm at the top of that, that right now. Uh, people are throwing around words like digital and social and entrepreneur and startup and loads of bullshit. So I'm just going to get us to set the scene, okay? Why are we here? It's because the cost of computing has plummeted, yeah? We all know that. I didn't add any numbers. We just know it. And the number of users of technology has rapidly, rapidly grown, not just in this country or in the region, but across the world, globally. And the combination of these two factors has meant that the knowledge and experience of applying technology to problems is growing exponentially. Every new platform that gets created and the combination of new platforms is enabling a rapid, rapid sort of ideation and testing and learning process, which means that almost every month we are seeing new, new ways of using technology. Right now, uh, you know, it's all about the Uberization and Airbnb and that sort of thing. In a year's time, we're going to have something completely different, which will be the new buzzword or new approach to using, um, you know, our smartphones, basically. I want to talk a bit about disruption. This graph here, the gray in the background, I, I, need, to, I need to get around to changing the colors on this. Um, the gray in the background is the standard sort of maturity curve uh, of a product. And you, know, you start off, the innovators and early adopters start with a new product, and then eventually other people see people using it, and you get an early majority, and then you sort of get the majority, and and you know, the laggards at the end start picking up a product. That's how you know, standard products uh, get adopted. That's the theory anyway. Disruptive products, by definition, are adopted so quickly that there's no time to catch up. And, dis and I, I make this point because I, I spend a lot of time in London hanging out in Shoreditch, um, to hang out with digital startups. I, I mention who I'm from, and, and they look at me like I'm some sort of old dinosaur. And, and uh, you know, I mean, the greys aren't showing that, that clearly yet. Um, and they talk about how disruptive they are. And I ask them how long they've been going. Oh, five years. That's not disruptive. Disruptive is something that takes off really, really quickly. And why is it important? Because Traditional businesses, in fact every business, follows a sort of S-curve. You might launch a product, you have your adoption curve, people start buying it, it peaks, and then you know, people get used to it, it becomes a bit more of a commodity. Other competitors move into the space, and the price starts sort of you know, falling, and people's use of it starts falling, and what happens is something else pops along, that sort of replaces that product area or service, and, and suddenly that grows, uh, and the first industry gets disrupted by the, by the next one coming along, and the third one to, uh, disrupts the second, and on and on. And Accenture published this book called Jumping the S-Curve a couple of years ago, because we believe that really good, innovative organizations are able to maintain a course which sort of keeps jumping across these curves, identifying when they're going to be disrupted and moving along. And uh, given high performance is, is, our, is our middle name, uh, we call this the path of high performers. Now the classic S-curve or disruption 
is Kodak, which is a which is a well well used sort of uh, example. Uh, apparently, they invented the digital camera. Apparently, they didn't think it was a very good idea, and uh, they got disrupted by digital. Let's look at another disruption, a bit more close to home or, or close to memory, at least. Do you remember Tom Tom? Tom Tom used to make these boxes, and the boxes would sit in your car. And on the box was a map, and it would tell you where you were, and it would tell you where you had to go. And, um, and then that red line is Google, which just decided to one day put navigation on Google Maps and eventually on the smartphone. And you can see almost directly in line, as Google Maps users grow, TomTom -tom revenues fall. The sort of epilogue to this story is that TomTom's revenues are now growing again because they own a bit of IP and they're sort of IP trolling. So they're, they're, they're starting to grow again, but from a much lower base. And this sort of happened, I think we all can remember really disrup disruptive technologies or digital experiences. I mean, I particularly remember Google just starting. I started working in 99 in the first dot-com uh, debacle. And, um, I was given a yellow pages at my desk, and I was told to put my name in it, and I was told that this is going to be what you use to call our clients and our contacts and such. And I used that for about a year or so, and then someone sent me a link. I mean, we had the internet. You know, we had Lycos, and we had Ask Jeeves, and all these other terrible things. You had to kind of triangulate a search response by using all of them at once. And then someone sent me a link to Google, and I never went back. In fact, within three, four months, everyone was using Google. That's disruptive. You can't, you can't compete against that. But it's different between business-to-consumer technologies and business-to-business -business technologies, particularly because when we look at startups and we look at the entrepreneurial sort of um, wave that we see, a large part of it is about being a lean and agile business. And what does that really mean? Being lean means pretty much you have very few decision points, very little red tape, an ability to make decisions very quickly. And agile means you can change direction very quickly. Large organizations, government agencies, any large group of people really struggle to do this well. And that's really useful because as a startup, you need to have the ability to change direction if something isn't working. And in the consumer space, it's an ideal place for this with smartphones and cloud and open source software and technology, which enables you to rapidly build things, test them out online, and if you're not getting any response, or you're not getting the response you need, you start tweaking, you start changing, within days, in fact, to start seeing who's actually using your software, who's actually downloading your app, and how are they using it? Where are they getting stuck in the process? It's all a really, really sort of interactive and detailed um, process. In business to business, when you are a technology company selling your technology or your digital uh, uh, you know, platform to larger businesses, it's really, really difficult because you don't get that feedback loop from consumers. You don't you can't just put it on the App Store and see how many downloads you get or how people are using it or where they're using it or when they're using it. And without that feedback, it's hard to be agile. It's hard to pivot your strategy. It doesn't matter how lean you are because you're just not getting the feedback. And so historically, and particularly in this country where we have a lot of B2B uh, uh, technologies, Venture capitalists and investors tend to shy away, and rightly so. It's a much bigger risk to invest in a B2B startup because it's harder for them to gain the feedback they need. And why is it harder? Well, because businesses are like big old dinosaurs. Traditional large businesses, they're ugly, they're old, they're probably going to eat you. And the challenge is, all the startups, they basically look like this dickhead. No offense. <laughs> Do you remember Nathan Barley? Very preeminent sort of a TV show about 10 years ago. That's Nathan Barley. Um, that's pretty much what 
half of London looks like now. And the fact is, they, they kind of rub up each other, they rub each other up the, the wrong way, and they, they tend to have a kind of fighty kind of relationship, but actually, what they really need is hugs. I'm going to explain why. There's several things that large organizations have that startups, particularly B2B startups, can really, really benefit from. And if you go back to the whole TomTom Tom and uh, Google Maps sort of thing, the reason why that was so disruptive was because the box that TomTom Tom was selling, suddenly everyone already had one of those boxes. You didn't have to buy a box to get a map, you had a box which a map you could download a map onto. And that was the infrastructure that enabled that. And that's what large organizations have. This is a classic infrastructure picture, in case you hadn't, hadn't noticed. Um, and that's what large organizations have. They have already an infrastructure in place, whether that's HR, marketing, um, you know, communications networks, or uh, you know, even just hardcore technology computing power, they, and, and branch offices, they have it in place. It's something you can already benefit from. They also have, a bit of a joke there, regulation. So they have spent a lot of time working with regulators, with uh, the government, to make sure and understand that they are within the law and they understand what's going on. That can be a good or a bad thing for a startup, but it's something the large corporate really, really has in spades and it's something a startup can't really invest in a lot of the time, particularly in the fintech space, which I'm going to talk about in a second. They also have lots of customers. The, the customers don't tend to look that happy, uh, but they have a lot of customers. And in fact, most startups, particularly in the B2B space, do not. Importantly, they also have networks. Networks of partners and other organizations that can build things together. Give you another example of, of disruption, the um, iTunes. Before iTunes, there were several attempts at creating digital music. You can remember Napster and you know, just MP3s in general. And each time, it never really took off. It actually took off when Steve Jobs went round and banged the heads together of the music industry and forced them onto a single platform by, by force of will and a bit of bullying, really. It's those networks that businesses can leverage, it's a, it's a good Accenture word, um, to bring together. And again, startups sort of struggle with that because they don't often have that sort of level of, uh, level of network. So I have a little argument, I, I, taking you back to the, uh, the dinosaur at the start. I say you should look, if you're a startup at a digital, small digital organization, you should look at, at large businesses like a friendly dinosaur. And in the fintech space, this is particularly uh, important because in fintech, you have three types of startup that are competing. Uh, in the space. One are startups that are selling stuff, they're selling financial services and they're using technology in order to do that. So that's people like uh, uh, TransferWise, uh, Wonga, um, uh, Nutmeg, which provides a personal finance management tool and others. Then you have a second group which is selling financial services technology to financial services providers. They can sell it to the first group, or they can sell it to banks, established banks. So for example, Currency Cloud is one of these. They sell their back-end FX payments network to TransferWise. They also sell it to tier two banks, established banks. And then you have a third category, which is infrastructure or technology providers, which are just selling technology to any business, but because financial services um, uh, the financial services businesses buy so much technology, this third category is also interested in fintech. And when you look at a large bank or any large organization, I say to these startups, think about where you fit, where are you on the friendly dinosaur um, to understand 
how you should interact with these organizations. So for instance, if what you're providing is a low value and no low necessity to that large organization, then consider yourself as sort of nibbling at the long tail. You're not really bothering them that much, and there's not really much, much value in you working together until you nibble your way up to the big part of the tail. A good example of this is Wonga. Wonga's been sort of pretty stained now, its reputation, but when it first kicked off, it really was a fintech startup because what they were doing was using new analytics algorithms to give people a credit score and loan very, very quickly, much faster than anyone else. And that was their, that was their differentiator. But the fact is, however disruptive they were being in their space, the part of the market that they were lending to was not of interest to the established financial services industry. In fact, they were making the market bigger because they were enabling the ability to lend to parts of the market which the established industry wasn't interested in. So that's an example of someone doing something that's low value to the industry and not really ne necessary. There's another part which is low value, but really, really important. And these are the sort of technology infrastructure players, security technology, uh, analytics technology, content management technology, stuff that all businesses need, but if you can do it better, quicker, faster, you're helping thin this dinosaur, helping them lose weight, helping them sort of you know, become more healthy and more nimble. Large businesses really like that, and they really will want to work with you because you're helping them with a sort of cost play. But the other place you can play is you can do something that's really high value to them and really necessary. So you're basically targeting their head and neck. If you are targeting their customers with something that is better, faster, cheaper, then they're going to get aggressive or they're going to get scared. And again, that doesn't mean you can't work with them, but you have to define how you work with them based on the fact that you are really being seen as competitors. Now, in the FinTech lab that we run, I've seen startups come to a panel of banks and basically say, in, in you know, you know, more diplomatic terms, but basically say, we're competing with you. We want to steal your customers. Will you mentor us? You can imagine what the banks say. I did this ages ago, this dinosaur, and someone put their hand up and said, what about um, high value, low necessity? So I thought, well, yes, actually, you can. You can be the gold watch for the dinosaur. If you're providing something that a large organization doesn't realize they need, but is actually helping them really grow, then that's actually the most important place to be because you can bring them new revenue streams in new ways, and it's probably the easiest way to, to, to connect with a large organization because you're literally just strapping on the, the gold watch. So the big challenge is, again, going back to the, the, the initial part, is that large organizations and startups are completely culturally different. And they really challenge, the big challenge is understanding and communicating with each other. But the key questions each have, it's worth knowing, is that, you know, for a large organization, however funky and nifty you are as a startup, the big concern is, will you be here tomorrow? because it's going to take me at least six months just to get the right people in the organization to agree that we should have a conversation about talking to you. So you better be around for that because it's gonna be a year before we can even get any the, the, the contracts out. And you know, the opposite of that is that the startup, rightly so, is thinking, well, is this guy gonna waste our time? We don't have the time to work with every large organization if this is the process that they go through. And, you know, we don't have the time and energy. We're a small company. And then there's the other side that even if you're really, really great and, and a great technology, trying to understand how you fit into that business's roadmap, whether that's a technology implementation roadmap or a strategic roadmap, is really, really difficult. Because guess what? Most large businesses, they don't even know themselves where they're really heading or at least they have competing parts of the organization that are still debating where they should be heading. And as a company coming in doing something disruptive and new that could really help this organization, you're risking stirring up a whole, you know, business of 
competing issues and budgets and timelines and, um, and concerns. So it, it, it can be really, really complicated. And then again, startups are thinking about how can we spend the time to make sure that when we stir this up, we're, we're the first thing they keep thinking of. Particularly when we've got to still build our technology because it's only half built and we've got to target other clients and we're still talking to investors and you know, often I work with startups in this situation and you wonder how they ever get the time to run their business because they're continuously running between investors, potential customers, existing customers and their families. So the FinTech Lab was something we set up a few years ago uh, to try and solve some of these issues, to try and build these two side, bring these two sides together in the financial services space and kind of get them to understand slowly how best to work with each other. It basically is like Dragon's Den. Um, let me check if I've got, yeah. So we have five, 15 CIOs. We have 15 tier one banks. The CIOs of those banks sit around and we bring in 20 startups. The 20 startups have been selected by the banks through an open application process. Accenture doesn't really get involved in the selection, it's the banks that are choosing them. And they come into a dragon's den and then they select seven companies for a three month program which is kind of like The Apprentice where the startups meet all the different people relevant to them in the banks and start getting feedback on their um, on their uh, proposition. So as I mentioned earlier, getting that feedback is really, really hard. So this program is really set up and we don't say to the startups or the banks, oh, you're definitely going to win, uh, get something out of this or, we're d you know, we don't say to the banks, oh, you're definitely going to see the next Facebook or to the startups, you'll be signing a contract in no time, mate. You know, it doesn't work like that. It's about them coming together and understanding what the issues are and for the startups to leave having learned what does a bank want from them, why, who should they speak to in the bank, and how do they explain it in the language of the bank, which is really, really valuable. And it's stuff you can get in three months from 15 banks rather than waiting three years to get the right meeting at one bank. The program was launched in uh, New York in 2011. Uh, we launched in London a year later and in Dublin and Hong Kong last year. And you can see here a few of the stats uh, 32 banks across the globe. We've had over 600 applications. Um, what I'm very proud of is that over $200 million have been raised from the startups after our program. And I should be very clear, we don't take an investment in the startups. This is not about us trying to make some money on the side. It's really about us trying to help uncover some of the issues and trying to accelerate some of the, 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 the challenges with large banks and, and startups working together. But it sort of leads on to the sort of role that we start seeing ourselves playing as a, a global consulting firm. As I mentioned, you have two sides of the story here. You have the small startups, which are very risky. They're changing very quickly. Uh, this, is a this is a classic consulting thing. It says delayed economic value, which in English means they don't have any money. Um, and they seek disruption. Um, but you know, on the right-hand side, you have the large organizations uh, don't want to change, but they need innovations desperately. So we increasingly see ourselves as an organization that can build the bridge between these two sides. Because on one hand, we're really interested in bringing new ideas to our clients, the large global 2000. So basically, the largest companies in the world are all our clients. We're really keen on being seen as the channel and the messenger for these new ideas. But we're also able, because we already have loads of people at these large global corporates, we also have the ability to reduce the risk for a startup. Because if we think a startup's good, and we think that we've got an opportunity at a client, we can take over the responsibility for chasing down that thing through the months and months of negotiation and meetings and calling and, and reminding the client that you know, we're supposed to talk about this thing and playing the politics and all that. And a startup can get on with their business. 
We can also tell a startup very quickly if there isn't an opportunity at a client because we're completely focused on selling opportunities into our clients. So we kind of see ourselves as a, as a good channel for this and we call this our open innovation program which I lead uh, in the UK and what we're doing is developing relationships with business to business startups which we think could benefit from this process. A process where we provide some of our strategy guys, some of our technology guys, and some of the people who work at our different clients to do an evaluation of a B2B startup and then decide whether it's something we can take forward. And I also really want to be very open to startups where we think we can't take forward uh, and, and say no very quickly rather than sort of stringing people along. Because if we do, we just become one of those large, corp those large corporates which are sort of wasting your time. So... It's about innovators coming to help us, to, coming to us to help them develop, sell, and grow. We can be a channel for the feedback. We can be a channel to help them grow their business, but also for clients to come to us and identify and implement new technologies. Because as a large organization, there's so many different things you can get involved with. And to be honest, you know, it's very easy to meet interesting startups these days. Uh, there's loads of agencies that will introduce you to them. But the challenge isn't meeting the interesting startup. The challenge is keeping them on your radar, making sure they fit with your strategic goals, making sure they fit with your technology uh, roadmap, uh, and also having the understanding and the influence to be able to change those goals and roadmap if you need to because of what you've learned in, in the world of startups and the world of disruption. Otherwise, you're just kind of playing around and not really affecting the business. Don't know how much time I have. I think I'm pretty much done. Two minutes. Um, I, we basically do this globally. I, I'm going to stop there. I don't know if we have time for questions or any points. Is, is, that a, is it possible? Sure. Yeah. Through the FinTech lab, yes. But through open innovation, it's any B2B technologies, not just financial. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, I'd say first come to us uh, or enroll in one of our accelerators, so you can come talk to me later. But. You know, aside from that, I think it's really, really important to get uh, really credible inf uh, advice from people within that industry. Because often a lot, of, a lot of industries, and this is the problem with B2B, is unless you've worked in an industry, it's really hard to understand what the actual problems are. And you can either be seen as being really naive because you've come up with a solution which isn't actually a problem or is something that they built a workaround for back in 1978 and they still use it and it's fine. Um, or you come, you, know, you, you, come and, um, you come from the industry but you have no ability to turn it into a product or be nimble enough to, be, to, uh, to build a digital business. So there is an interesting gap there. I would look for people in the industry who are credible, know what they're actually talking about, to get that sort of advice. Because just knocking on the door of a large business, you, you, you know, the chance of you meeting the right person at the right time with the budget and being given the responsibility to make that decision oh, is pretty small. So I would try and find people who, who, who can help. Any other questions? Great. Okay, thank you very much.